All right. Hello, everyone. Um, let's get started. I want to talk about um, a system called certificate transparency today. Um, and this is a bit of a, a departure from most of the topics we talked about. I mean, so far, we've talked about distributed systems that are really closed systems where all the participants are trustworthy. Um, they're all maybe be run, being run by the same uh, sort of mutually trusting organization, like RAFT is that way. You know, we just assume that the RAFT peers do what they're supposed to do. Um, but there's also plenty of systems out there, particularly systems sort of built at internet scale, where the systems are open um, and anyone can participate, be an active participant um, in, in some big systems out there. Um, and if you build systems that are completely open in that way, um, there's often no single universally trusted authority that everybody is willing to trust to, to run the system or to protect it. Um, that is, everybody is sort of potentially mutually suspicious of everyone else. Um, and if that's the situation, you have to be able to build useful systems out of um, mutually distrusting pieces. Um, and this makes, in, in any sort of internet-wide open system, this makes trust and security sort of top-level systems issues when you're thinking about um, designing a distributed system. So the most basic question when you're building an open system is, um, when I'm talking to another computer or another person, uh, you need to know, are you talking to the right other computer? Are you talking to the, the right website? Um, and this problem is actually close to unsolvable. Uh, it turns out there's really, there's lots of solutions and none of them really work that well. Um, but it is the problem that certificate transparency, today's topic is, is um, trying to help with. Um, the material today ties sort of backwards in the course to consistency. It turns out that a lot of what certificate transparency do doing is ensuring that all parties see the same information about certificates. So that's a real consistency issue. Um, and this material also ties forward to blockchain systems um, like blockchain, which is what we'll be talk talking about next week. Um, and certificate transparency is um, among the relatively few non-cryptocurrency uses of a blockchain-like design. All right, so um, by way of introduction, I, I wanna start with the situation on the web, um, uh, with web security at any rate, um, as it existed before 1995, before certificates. Um, so this is um, before 1995. And in particular, there was a, there was a kind of attack in those days uh, that people were worried about called a man in the middle attack. So this is, um, man in the middle. And this is a name for a class of attacks, a style of attack. So, you know, the, the setup in those days is you have the internet um, and you have people running browsers, um, you know, sitting in front of their computer attached to the internet. Maybe I'm sitting in front of my computer. I want to talk to a specific server. Exposing like what I want to do is talk to gmail.com, right? And ordinarily, I would, you know, maybe contact the DNS system. I, you know, I would, as a user, I would maybe type gmail.com. I would sort of know what it was I wanted to talk to, namely gmail.com. My browser would talk to DNS server, say, what's gmail.com? It would reply with a IP address. I'd connect to that IP address. And, you know, I need to authenticate myself, so I'd probably type my password to gmail, to gmail's website and then Gmail would show me my, my email. Um, without some kind of story for security, this system is actually quite easy to attack and turned out to be easy to attack. Um, and the uh, one style of attack is a, what's called a man in the middle attack where some evil person sets up a, uh, another web server that serves pages that look just like Gmail web servers, like they'll ask for your login and password. Right, um, and then the attacker would maybe intercept my DNS packets, um, or just guess when I would have sent a DNS packet and come up with a fake reply that instead of uh, providing the real IP address of the real gmail.com server, would provide the email address of, my, of the attacker's fake computer. Um, and then the user's browser, instead of talking to Gmail, would actually, um, unknown to them, uh, 
uh, be talking to the attacker's computer. The attacker's computer would provide a web page, looks just like a login page, user types their login and password. Um, and now the uh, attacker's computer can forward that to the real Gmail login for you. Of course, you don't know that. Um, you know, get your current inbox back to the attacker's computer, which presumably records it along with your password and then uh, sends your inbox or whatever uh, to the browser. Um, and this allows a, you know, if you can execute this kind of man in the middle attack, um, the attacker's computer can record your password, record your email, and you'll never be the wiser. Um, and though before certificates and SSL and HTTPS, there was really no defense against this. Um, okay, so this is the man in the middle attack, and this attacker here is the man in the middle, uh, looks just like Gmail to the browser, pretends to be the user when talking to Gmail so that it can actually. Um, get the information from Gmail required to trick the user into thinking it's really Gmail. All right, so this is the attack. Um, in the mid 90s, people came up with uh, certificates with um, SSL or it's also called TLS. It's what the protocol, the security protocol that you're using when you uh, use HTTPS links. Um, and here the game was that gmail.com was going to have a uh, a public-private key pair. So we'd have a private key that only um, Gmail knows sitting in its server. Um, and then when you connect, well, you're the user, you connect somewhere, you ask to connect to Gmail, you know. Um, and in order to verify that you're really talking to Gmail, the user's gonna demand Gmail prove that it really owns uh, Gmail's private key. Well, of course, where does your browser find out um, Gmail's private key from, or Gmail's public key, which is what you need to check um, that it really has the private key. There's also this um, notion of certificate authorities and certificates. So there'd be a certificate authority. When Gmail set up its server, it would um, contact the certificate authority, maybe on the phone or by email or something, and say, look, you know, I, I want a certificate for um, the DNS name gmail.com and the certificate authority would sort of try to verify that oh yes the, whoever's asking for the certificate really owns that name you know, it really is Google or whoever owns gmail.com and if so um, the certificate authority would provide a certificate um, back to gmail.com which basically what a certificate contains is the name of um, the web server the uh, web server's public key and um, a signature over this the certificate um, made with the certificate authority's uh, private key. So this is sort of a self-contained assertion uh, checkable by checking the signature, an assertion by the certificate authority that the public key of gmail.com is really this uh, public key. Gmail.com server would I just keep a copy of the certificate. If you connect to gmails.com server with HTTPS, the first thing it does is sends you back this certificate. Um, at this point, it's just a certificate, right? And of course, since gmail.com is willing to give it to anybody, it's it, the certificate itself is not at all private. It's quite public. Um, and then the browser would send some information, maybe like a random number, for example, to uh, the server um, and ask it to sign it with its private key. Um, and then the browser can check using the public key in the certificate that uh, the random number, its random number was really signed by the uh, private key um, that's associated with the public key in the certificate, and therefore that whoever it's talking to is uh, really the entity that the certificate authority believes is gmail.com. All right, and now the reason why this makes man in the middle attacks much harder is that, um, yeah, you know, you can set up a, a a rogue server that looks just like gmail.com and maybe you can even hack the DNS system. Indeed, you still can, um, if you're sufficiently clever or powerful, hack the DNS system to um, tell people's browsers that, oh, they should go to your server instead of gmail.com. But once somebody's browser contacts your server, um, you're not presumably gonna be able to produce a certificate that says, um, well, you, you can produce Gmail certificate, but then, Gmail certificate has Gmail's public key. Your server doesn't have their private key, so you can't sign the challenge the browser sent you. Um, and presumably, since you're not the real Google and not the real 
uh, Gmail, you're not going to be able to persuade a certificate authority to give you a certificate um, associating gmail.com with your public key that you know. Um, and so this certificate scheme made man in the middle attacks quite a bit harder. And, you know, indeed they are quite a bit harder now because of certificates. Um, okay, so it turns out though that the certificate scheme as um, people now have a lot of experience with it, um, almost 25 years of experience with it, so we now know the th kind of things that go wrong. It was originally imagined that there would just be a couple of trustworthy certificate authorities who would do a good job of checking that requests really came from who they claim to come from, that if somebody asked for a certificate for gmail.com, that the certificate authorities would indeed actually verify that the request came from the owner of gmail.com and not hand out certificates to random people for gmail.com. Um, but it, that turns out to be very challenging. Um, for Google, maybe you can convince, this certificate authority can convince itself that a request comes from Google, but you know, for just x.com, now, it's very hard to have a certificate authority reliably able to say, oh yeah, gosh, this request really came from the person who really does own the DNS name x.com. All right, um, a worse problem is that while originally they were envisioned there'd be only a few certificate authority, there are now literally hundreds of certificate authorities out there. Um, and any certificate authority can generate a certificate for any name. Um, and indeed may want to. You're allowed to change certificate authorities. If you're a website owner, you can change certificate authority to whoever you like. Um, so there's no sense in which certificate authorities have limits on their powers. They can, any certificate authority can produce any certificate. Um, and um, now browsers have, you know, there's a couple hundred certificate authorities and that means that each browser has built into it like Chrome or Firefox or something has built into it a list of the public keys of all the certificate, all couple hundred certificate authorities. And if any of them sign, has signed a certificate produced by web server, the certificate's acceptable. Um, the result of this is that there have been multiple incidents of certificate authorities producing bogus certificates, that is producing certificates certificates that said they were certificate for Google or Gmail or some other real company, um, but were actually issued to someone totally else, absolutely not issued, you know, that certificate for G one of G Google's names, but not issued to Google, issued to someone else. Like, um, and, you know, sometimes this happens just by mistake because certificate authority doesn't realize that they're doing the wrong thing. And sometimes it's actually quite malicious. I mean, there have certainly been uh, certificates issued to people who just wanted to snoop on people's traffic and mount man in the middle attacks and did mount man, man in the middle attacks. Um, in today's readings, I mentioned a couple of these incidents. Um, and they're particularly troubling because they're hard to prevent because there's so many certificate authorities and not all of them. Um, Oh, the, sorry, the last question, what's the last line of the cert box? It's a signature over the certificate by the, certi using, by the certificate authorities, using the certificate authorities' private key. Okay, so there have been incidents of bogus certificates, certificates for real websites like Google issued to totally the wrong people, and those certificates have been abused. Um, and it's not clear how to fix the certificate authority system itself to prevent them because there's so many certificate authorities and they really, um, you just can't expect that they're gonna be completely reliable. So what can we do about this? Um, one possibility would be to have a single online database of all valid certificates so that when a browser, you know, browser contacts a website, the website hands it a certificate, you know, might or might not be valid, then maybe you could imagine the uh, browser would contact the global valid certificate database and ask, is this really a certificate or is it a bogus certificate issued by um, a rogue certificate authority? Um, the problem is, well, there's many problems with that um, approach. One is, it's still not clear how you can how anybody can distinguish valid, correctly issued certificates from bogus certificates. Because typically you just don't know who the proper owner of DNS names is. Um, furthermore, you need to allow certificate owners to change certificate authorities or renew their certificates, or they may lose their private key and need a new certificate uh, to replace their old certificate. 
because using a new public private key pair. Um, so people's certificates change all the time. Um, and finally, even if technically it were possible to distinguish correct certificates from bogus ones, um, there's no entity that everybody would trust to do it. You know, everybody in the world, both, you know, the Chinese, the Iranians, the Americans, you know, there's not any one um, outfit that they all trust. And that's the root reason why there's so many certificate authorities. So we really can't, um, really can't expect there to be a single clearinghouse that accurately distinguishes between valid and invalid certificates. However, um, what certificate authority, certificate transparency doing is doing is essentially um, trying to do the best that it's possible to do, um, you know, the longest step it can towards a database of uh, valid, trustworthy certificates. Um, so now I'm going to sort of give an overview of the general strategy of certificate transparency. Um, the uh, style of certificate transparency is that it's an audit system uh, because um, it's so hard, hard to impossible to just decide, does this person own a name? You know, certificate transparency isn't a building a system that prevents bad things from happening, which would require you to be able to detect right away um, that a certificate was bogus. Instead, certificate transparency is going to enable audit. Um, that is, it'll, it's a system to cause all the information to be public so that it can be inspected by people who care. That is, it's going to, if, you know, maybe people, it'll still allow people to issue bogus certificates, but it's going to ensure those certificates are public and that everybody can see them, including whoever it is that owns the name, um, that the name that's in the bogus certificate. And so this fixes the problem with the um, pre-certificate transparency system where certificate authorities could issue bogus certificates and no one would ever know. And they could even give them to a victim, a few victim browsers who would be tricked by them. Um, and still, because certificates aren't generally public, um, they could, somebody could, a certificate authority could issue a, a bogus certificate for anybody, for Google or Microsoft, and Google and Microsoft might never realize it. And the incidents that have come to light have generally been discovered only by accident, um, not because they were sort of foredoomed to be discovered. So instead of relying on accidental discovery of bogus certificates, uh, certificate transparency is going to sort of force them into the light where they, it's much easier to notice them. Um, again, so it has a sort of audit flavor, not a, not a prevention flavor. Okay, so um, the basic structure, again, we have gmail.com or some other um, service that wants a certificate. As usual, they're going to ask some one of the hundreds of CAs for a certificate uh, when, when, when the ser web server is first set up. Um, so we're going to ask a certificate, and the certificate authority is going to send this um, certificate back to the web server, because of course it's the web server that gives the certificate to the, uh, to the browser. Um, and at the same time, though, the certificate authority is going to send a copy of the certificate or, um, or equivalent information to a certificate transparency log server. And there's going to, um, in the real system, there's multiple independent certificate transparency log servers. I can assume there's just one. So this is some service that, you know, we don't have, turns out we're not going to have to trust. And, um, but the certificate authority is going to send a certificate to the certificate log service, which has been maintaining a log of, of all issued certificates or all ones that certificate authorities have told it about. When it gets a new certificate, it's going to append it to its log. Um, so this you know, might have millions of certificates in it after a while. Now, <clears throat> when the browser, um, when some human wants to talk to a website, um, they, you know, they, they talk to, they set up an HTTPS connection to Gmail, Gmail sends them a certificate back, and the um, browser is going to send that certificate to the certificate log server and say, is this certificate in the log? Um, and the certificate log server is going to say yes or no, is there a certificate in the log? Now, and if it is, then the browser will go ahead and use it. Um, now, the fact that it's in the log, 
you know, doesn't mean it's not bogus, right? Because any certificate authority, including the ones that are out there that are malicious or badly run, any certificate authority can um, insert a certificate into the log system and therefore uh, perhaps trick users into using it. So, so far we haven't built a system that uh, prevents abuse. However, um, it is the case that no browser will use a certificate unless it's in the log. So at the same time, um, Gmail is gonna run a, what the um, CT system calls a monitor. And th for now, we'll just assume that there's a monitor associated with every website. So this monitor periodically also talks to the certificate log servers and asks it, um, please give me a copy of your log, or really, you know, please give me a copy of whatever new has been added to your log since I last asked. And that means that the monitor is going to build up. It's going to be aware of every single certificate that's going to be in the, that's in the log. And but also because the monitor is associated with Gmail, the monitor knows what Gmail's uh, correct certificate is. So if some rogue certificate authority issues a certificate for Gmail that's not the one that Gmail itself asked for, um, then Gmail's monitor will stumble across it in the certificate log um, because Gmail's monitor knows Gmail's correct certificate. Um, now, of course, the rogue certificate authority doesn't have to send its certificate to the certificate log system. But in that case, when browsers um, you know, maybe accidentally connect to the attacker's web server um, and the attacker's web server gives them the bogus certificate, if they haven't put it in the log, then the browser won't believe it and will abort the connection uh, because it's not in the log. So the log sort of forces, uh, because browsers require certificates to be in the log, the log forces all certificates to be public where they can be audited and checked by monitors um, who know what the proper certificates are. And so some monitors are run by big companies and the companies know their own certificates. Some monitors are run by certificate authorities on behalf of their customers. And again, those certificate authorities know what certificates they've issued to their customers. And they can at least alert their customers if they see a certificate they didn't issue for one of their customers' names. Um, in addition, there's some totally third-party monitor systems where you give the third-party monitor um, your names and your, and your valid certificates, and it checks for unexpected certificates. Um, for your names. All right, so this is the overall scheme, um, but it depends very much on browsers seeing the very same log contents that monitors see. Um, and but remember, we were up against this problem that we're not sure that we can trust any component in this system. So indeed, we found the certificate authorities, some of them are malicious or have employees who can't be trusted or are sloppy and don't follow the rules. So we're gonna assume, we have to assume that the same will be true of the certificate log servers, that some of them will be malicious, some of them may conspire with rogue um, certificate authorities and intentionally try to help them issue um, bogus certificates. Some of them may be sloppy, some of them may be legitimate, but maybe some of their employees are, are corruptible. You pay them a big enough bribe, they'll do something funny to the log, delete something or add something to it. Um, so what we need to build is a log that, even though the log operator may be uh, um, not cooperating, not trustworthy, we can still be sure, or at least know if it's not the case, um, that browsers are seeing the same log contents as, as monitors. So if a browser uses a certificate that was in the log, that the monitor who owns that name will eventually see it. Um, so what we need to do is um, we need to build a log system um, that is append only so that it can't show a certificate to a browser and then delete it before monitors see it. So append only. Um, um, no forks in the sense that um, we don't want the uh, log system to basically keep two logs, one of which it shows to browsers um, and one of which it shows to monitors. So we need no forks. Um, and um, we need untrusted. We can't be sure that the uh, 
certificate servers are correct. Um, so just to back up a bit, the um, critical properties we need for the log system, so larger than just the log servers, but the entire system of the log servers plus the various checks is um, we have to prevent deletion. That is, we, we need the uh, logs to be append only because if a log server could um, delete uh, items out of its log, then it could effectively show a bogus certificate to a browser, um, claim it's in the log and may be in the log at that time, and the browser uses it. But then maybe the certificate server could delete that certificate from its log um, so that by the time the monitors came to look at the log, the bogus certificate wouldn't be there. Um, so we need to have, have a system um, that either prevents deletion or at least um, detects if deletion occurs. So that's the sense in which the um, system needs to be append only. Um, and we also have to prevent what's called equivocation. Um, or no, we have to prevent forks or, or equi equivalently equivocation. Um, so, um, you know, if, if the, maybe the certificate log servers could um, be implementing append only logs, but if it, if it uh, implemented two different append only logs and showed one to uh, browsers and showed the other append only log to monitors, then we could be in a position where, yeah, you know, the, the browser that we showed, the log we showed to browsers contains the bogus certificate, but the uh, uh, log we showed to monitors doesn't, doesn't contain the um, bogus certificate. So we have to rule out equivocation too, all without trusting the servers. Um, so how can we do this? Um, so now we're getting into the kind of uh, details that the last of the assignments was talking about. Um, the first step is this thing called a Merkle tree. And uh, this is something that's sort of, that the log servers are expected to build on top of the log. So the idea is that um, there's the actual log itself, which is a sequence of certificates, you know, certificate one, certificate two, presumably in the order that uh, um, uh, certificate authorities ask certificates to be added to the system. You know, the prime millions, I'm just gonna assume there's a couple. Um, now, um, it's gonna turn out, you know, we, we don't want to have the browsers have to download the whole log. And so we need tools to, so that we can allow the logging system to basically send um, uh, trustworthy summaries um, or unambiguous summaries of what's in the log to the, uh, to the browsers. And we'll talk in a bit about it, exactly what those summaries are used for. Um, but the basic scheme is that um, the uh, log servers are gonna use cryptographic hashes to um, sort of hash up the complete set of records that are in the log to produce a single cryptographic hash, which is uh, typically these days about 256 bits long. So the cryptographic hash summarizes the contents of the log. Um, and the way that's done is that the, uh, is as a basically a tree structure of pairs where we're hash, always hashing together pairs of numbers um, at the zeroth level. So um, I'm gonna write H for hash. Uh, each one of the log entries has a hash. So we're gonna have Sort of at the base level, we have the hash of each log entry, um, each certificate. And then we're gonna hash up pairs. Uh, so um, at the next level, we're gonna have a hash of this and concatenated with this and a hash of this concatenated with this, these two hashes. And then at the top level, sort of, um, we're gonna have a hash where we're, what we're doing is hashing these two, the concatenation of these two hashes. And this single hash here is a um, unambiguous uh, sort of stand-in for the complete log. One of the properties of these cryptographic hashes like SHA-256 is that it's not feasible to find two inputs to the hash function that produce the same output. And that means if you tell somebody the output of the hash function, there's only one input um, you're ever gonna be able to find that uh, produce that output. So if the log server does hash up in this way, uh, the contents of its logs, only this sequence of these log records 
um, will ever be able to produce that hash. We're guaranteed effectively that the um, log server is not gonna be able to find some other log that produces the same final uh, tree hash as this sequence of log entries. All right, so this is the Merkle tree. This is the sort of tree hash um, that summarizes the entire log at the top of the Merkle tree. Um, there, there's, uh, we'll actually call it a um, signed tree head because in fact, the log servers take this hash that's at the top of the tree and sign it with their private key and give that to uh, clients, to, to browsers and monitors. Um, and the fact that they signed it means that they, they can't disavow it later. And it was really them that produced it. So that's, you know, just to be able to catch lying, uh, lying log servers. Um, and so the point here is that once uh, a log server has revealed a particular um, signed tree head to a browser or monitor, um, it's committed to some specific log contents because it won't be able to ever produce a different log contents that produce the same hash. So these hashes are really function as kind of commitments. Um, okay, so this is the uh, what the log, what the Merkle tree looks like for a, a particular log. Now. The third reading today sort of outlined how to extend the log, how to add records to the log um, for arbitrary numbers of records. Um, I'm just going to assume that the log always grows by um, factors of two, which is impractical, but makes it easier to explain. Um, and so that means that as certificate authorities send in new certificates to add to the log, the log server will, will wait until it um, has as many new records as it has old records, and then um, produce another tree head. And the way it does that is it's going to, in order to ex extend the log, um, the log server is going to wait till it has another four records, and then it's going to hash them pairwise, um, just as before, and then it'll produce a new um, tree head that is the hash of the concatenation of these two hashes, right? Um, and this is the new um, tree head for the new expanded log. And so that means as time goes on and uh, a log server, this log grows longer and longer, it produces sort of higher and higher uh, sequence of higher and higher tree heads as the log grows. Okay. So, um, so this is this is the structure that we're expecting log servers to maintain. Of course, who knows what they're actually doing, um, especially if they're malicious. But the protocol, the certificate transparency protocol, sort of is written that you know as if the log server was was actually doing this. All right. So what do we need to do? What are what do uh, the point of this Merkle trees is to use them to um, force uh, log servers to prove certain things about the logs that they can, uh, about the log that they're maintaining. We're gonna wanna know what those, uh, those proofs look like. So the first kind of proof is um, what I'll call a uh, proof of inclusion. And this is what a uh, browser needs when it, when it wants to find out if a certificate that has just been given by a web server, if that certificate is really in the log, um, it's going to ask the certificate. Um, it's going to ask the log server, "Look, here's a certificate. You know, is it is it in your log?" And the certificate server is going to send back um, a proof of actually not just that the certificate is in the log, but actually where it is, what its position is in the log. Um, and of course, the browser wants this proof because it doesn't want to use the certificate if it's not in the log. Because if it's not in the log, then monitors won't see it, and there's no would have no protection against the certificate being bogus. Um, and it needs to be a proof because um, we we uh, we can't afford to let the log servers a malicious log server change its mind. Right? We don't want to take the log server's word for it because then it might a malicious log server might say yes. Um, and this proof is going to help us catch, you know, if a log server does lie, these proofs are going to help us catch the fact that the log servers lied um, and produce evidence that 
the log server is malicious and should be ignored from now on. Um, that's sort of the ultimate sanction against the log servers is that the browsers actually have a list of acceptable log servers. Um, and um, these proofs would be part of the evidence to um, cause one of the log servers to be taken out of the log if it was malicious. Okay, so we need a proof. We want the log server to produce a proof that a given certificate um, is in its log. Um, so actually the first step is that um, uh, the browser asks the log server for the current um, signed tree head. So what we're, the browser is really asking is, is this certificate in the log that's summarized by this current, by this um, signed tree head? And the log server may lie about the signed tree head, right? So the browser asks it for the current signed tree head and then asks for a proof that the certificate is in the log. Um, the log server could lie about the signed tree head, and we'll deal about that. We'll consider that later. Um, but for now, let's assume that the, um, the uh, browser has the correct signed tree head um, and is demanding a proof. Okay, so for simplicity, I'm, I'm just gonna explain how to do this for a log with two records. And it turns out that extending that to a log with, with other more higher power of two records is uh, relatively easy. Um, so the browser actually has a particular signed tree head. Um, let's suppose the correct log that sits under that signed tree head is the two element log A, B, uh, for particular certificates A and B. Um, and that means that uh, the correct uh, Merkle tree for that is here we, is at the bottom as the hashes of A and B. Um, and then the signed tree head is um, actually the hash of the hash of A concatenated with the hash of B. So, um, so let's suppose this is the signed tree head that the certificate that the log server actually gave to the client. Um, of course, the client doesn't, this client only knows this value, this final hash value, it doesn't actually know what is in the log. Um, the proof, if the, um, if the browser asks for a proof that A is in the log, then um, the proof that the log server can return is simply um, the proof for A is A in the log is simply um, A's position in the log and um, the hash of the other <laughs> element in the log. So zero and the hash of B. And that is enough information for A to convince itself that, for, sorry, for the client to convince itself that A really is at position zero um, because it can take, it knows the certificate it's interested in, it can hash it. Um, part of the proof was the hash of the other element in this lowest level hash. Um, so the browser can now knows HA and HB, it can hash them together, um, can execute this hash and see if the result is the same as the signed tree head that it has. And if it is, um, then that means that the uh, certificate log has actually produced a valid proof that uh, certificate A is at position B, um, sorry, is at position zero in the log summarized by the, this signed tree head. Um, and it turns out that um, in, larger, um, in larger logs, um, you know, if you're looking for, if you need a proof that A is really here, all you need is the sequence of hashes of the other branch um, of each hash up to the signed tree head that you have. Uh, so in a four element log, if you, if you need a proof that A is at position zero, you need this hash, and you need this, then you need this hash. And if a log is bigger, you know, eight elements, then you also need this hash, assuming that you have the signed tree head. So you can take the element you know and hash it together with each of these other hashes and see if it's equal to the signed tree head. Um, okay, so if the browser asks is, supposing the browser asks whether X is in the log at position zero. Well, X isn't in the log, right? Um, so hopefully there's no easy way for the log server to produce a proof that X is in the log at position zero. But suppose the log server wants to lie and it's in the position where it already exposed a signed tree head 
for a log that contained A and then B. Um, browser doesn't know it was A and B, it doesn't know what's in the log, and the log server wants to trick the client into the browser into thinking that it's really X at position zero. Well, it turns out that um, in order to do that, um, the for, for this small log, the certificate server has to um, produce um, for some y, it needs to find a y um, that if it takes its hash when concatenated with x, you know, so this is that, um, that it's equal to the signed tree head, right? Because the client, we're assuming the client already has a signed tree head. We need to find a um, some number here that when hashed together with the hash of x that the client's asking about produces that same signed tree head. Well, we know the signed tree head, or the assumption is the signed tree head was actually for some other log, right? Because we're trying to rule out the possibility that the log server can um, give you a signed tree head for one log, but that convince you um, that something else is in that log that's not there. So the signed tree head really was produced by um, from the hashes of uh, the records that really were in the log. And um, now we need, and since you know x is definitely different from a, that means the hash of x is different from the hash of a, and that means that the log server needs to find um, two different inputs to the hash function that produce the same output. Um, and the assumption, widely believed to be um, true for practical purposes, is that that's not possible for cryptographic hashes. Therefore, if the sent the um, signed tree head was produced by hashing up one log, that it will not be possible to find these sort of other hash values um, that would be required to uh, produce a proof that some other element was in the log that wasn't really there. Any questions about this, uh, about anything? Interesting, a nice thing about this is that the proofs are, the proofs uh, consist of just the sort of other hashes on the way up to the root. Um, if there's n certificates, there's only log n other hashes. And so the proofs are reasonably concise. In particular, they're much, much smaller than the full log. And since you know every browser that needs to connect to a website um, is gonna need one of these proofs, uh, it's good if they're small. Okay, well, this was whole discussion was assuming that the uh, signed tree head that the um, browser had was the correct signed tree head. Um, if the, but you know, there's no uh, immediate reason to believe that the log server would have given, if the log server is malicious and it wants to trick a client, you know, why would it give the client the correct signed tree head? Why doesn't it give it just in the beginning the signed tree head for the bogus log that it wants to trick the client into using? So um, we have to be prepared for the possibility that the log server has cooked up um, a just completely different log for the browser that's not like anybody else's log and just contains the bogus certificates that um, a malicious log server wants to trick this client into believing. Um, so, what do we do about that? Well, um, it turns out that this is, at least in the first instance, this is totally possible. Um, you know, usually what's going to happen, usually the way this would play out is that um, we'd have some browser that was, you know, seeing the correct logs until some point in time when, when uh, uh, somebody wanted to attack it. Um, and, you know, you want the browser still to be able to use all the websites that it's ordinarily seeing, um, plus a, uh, a sort of different log with bogus certificates that the log server wants to trick just that client, just that victim browser into using. Um, so now this is a fork, a fork attack, um, or more broadly, equivocation. And the reason why people call this uh, kind of attack a fork attack is that if we just, never mind the Merkle tree for a moment, if we just consider the log, um, usually the log already has, you know, millions of certificates in it, um, and everybody's seen the beginning part of the log. Then at some point in time, um, 
we want to attack, we want to persuade um, our victim to use some bogus certificate, B. Um, but we don't want to show B to anybody else, certainly not to the monitor. So we're going to sort of cook up this other log um, that sort of continues as usual and contains new submissions, but definitely doesn't contain the bogus certificate B. Um, and you know, what this looks like is a fork because both the sort of main log that monitors are shown is kind of off on one fork and then this log we're cooking up, especially to trick a victim, is, is a different fork. This is the construction that the uh, malicious log server would have to produce if it wants to trick a browser into using um, a bogus certificate. Um, and again, these are possible. It's, it's possible to, to do this at least um, briefly in, with certificate authority, with certificate transparency. Um, luckily, though, this is not the end of the story. Um, and certificate authority contains some tools that allow it to uh, make forks much more difficult. Um, so the basic scheme um, is that, um, uh, or the, this isn't, this is the way certificate authority is sort of intended to work, all certificate transparency is intended to work, but doesn't quite. Um, what's going on here is that the, uh, the, the monitors and people who aren't being attacked are gonna see a, um, a sign tree, a particular sign tree head, let's say sign tree head one, of course it's gonna change as the uh, log extends. And the victim, we, we know, must see some other sign tree head because this is a sign tree head that is hashed over this um, bogus certificate. It's guaranteed to be different from the sign tree heads that the, the malicious servers showing to monitors. <laughs> if only the browsers and monitors could compare notes, they would maybe instantly realize that they were seeing different trees. And all it takes is comparing, you know, if we play our cards right, all it takes is comparing the signed tree heads that they've gotten from the log server to realize, wait a minute, <clears throat> we're seeing different logs. Uh, something's terribly wrong. Um, so the critical thing we need to do is have the, um, have the different participants in the system um, be able to compare signed tree heads and the, uh, certificate transparency has a provision for this called gossip. Um, and the way it's intended to work is that browsers, um, well, the details don't really matter, but <clears throat> what it really amounts to is that all the participants sort of drop off the recent signed tree heads they've seen into a big pool <clears throat> that they all inspect um, to try to figure out if there's inconsistent signed tree heads that clearly indicate divergent logs that have forked. Um, so we're going to gossip, which really means um, exchange um, signed tree heads and compare. Um, it turns out that current certificate transparency implementations don't do this, but <clears throat> they ought to, <clears throat> and they'll figure it out at some point. All right. Um, okay, so the question is, given two signed tree heads, um, how do we decide if there are evidence that the log has been forked. Um, the thing that makes this hard is that even if the log hasn't been forked, um, as it's appended to, new signed tree heads um, will become current. So, you know, maybe signed tree head one was the um, legitimate signed tree head of the log at this point, and then some more certificates are added, and signed tree head three becomes the correct head of the log, and then sign tree head four, et cetera. Um, so really what this gossip comparison <clears throat> needs to do is distinguish situations where one sign tree head is really describes a prefix, a log that's a prefix of the log described by another sign tree head, because this is the legitimate situation where yeah, the two, these two sign tree heads are different, but the second one really does subsume the first one. We want to distinguish that from two sign tree heads that are different where neither um, describes a log that's a prefix of the other one's log. We want to tell these two cases apart. Um, and this uh, telling that um, situation apart is the purpose of the um, consistency proof, the log or Merkle consistency proof that the readings talk about. So this is the Log consistency proof. Uh, 
Um, so the game here is that we're given two signed tree heads, um, H1 and H2, and we're asking, is H1's log um, a prefix? This is not, these are two, these are hashes. So it's really asking about the log that the hashes represent. Um, and, you know, we're hoping the answer is yes. And if the answer is no, that means that the log server has forked us and is hiding something from one party or the other. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, it turns out that um, as we, uh, as I mentioned before, the, um, as the Merkle tree, as the log grows, the Merkle tree also grows. And what we see is a sequence of um, sign tr of tree heads. Um, each one, um, as the log doubles in size, each one has its, as its left thing. Here, let me draw in the actual hash function. So this hash function is hashing up two things, the result of this hash function um, is one of the inputs to the next sign tree head. The result of this hash function is one of the inputs to the next sign tree head. I know we get this um, kind of tree of, uh, oops, of sign tree heads, right? And um, any two sign tree heads, if they're legitimate, you know, if H1's log is a prefix of H2, that means that maybe this one's H1 and this one's H2, um, and they're gonna have this relationship. They, you know, if H1 is a prefix of H2, then they must have this relationship where H2 was produced by taking H1, hashing it with some other thing, and maybe hashing that with some other thing until we get to the point where uh, we find H2. Um, and what that means is that if, um, a browser or monitor challenges a log, um, a log server to prove that H1's log is really a prefix of H2's log. Um, what the log server has to produce is this sequence of other, the other side of each of the ha signed tree head hashes on the way from H1 um, to H2. And this is the proof. Um, and then again, and, you know, this is reminiscent of the uh, <clears throat> inclusion proofs. Then to check the proof, um, uh, you need to take H1, hash it with the first other thing, um, you know, hash that along with the second other thing until you get to the last one of these, and that had better be equal to H2. And if it is, it's a proof that uh, H2 is a suffix of H1, otherwise, um, the log server has evidently <clears throat> tried to fork you. Um, and again, you know, the basis of this is that um, there's no other, um, you know, H2 really isn't, I'm supposing H1 isn't a prefix of H2, there's no way that, uh, <clears throat> since H2 was created from some actual log that's not the same as H1, there's no way that the um, log server could cook up uh, these values that, that are required to um, cause the hashes, this sort of repeated hash of H1 to equal H2, if H2 really didn't come from here. Uh, because we're assuming that um, the cryptographic hashes prevent you from finding two different inputs that produce the same output. Um, all right. Okay, so this is the log consistency proof. Um, Okay, so the question is who usually challenges the log server? So I'll actually talk about that in a minute, but it turns out that um, both browsers and monitors, um, well, both browsers and monitors challenge the log server. It's actually usually the browsers challenging the log server. That's the most important thing. Um, but there's two points in time at which you need to challenge the log server to produce these proofs. Um, and I'll talk about both of them. Um, all right. <clears throat> okay, actually, so, so um, the, the first place at which um, 
one point at which these proofs are used is for gossip, as part of gossip, as I outlined. Um, and the, the scheme that's intended for gossip is that uh, browsers will periodically talk to some central repository or some set of central repositories um, and just contribute to a pool of signed tree heads, the signed tree heads they've recently seen from the log server. Um, and the browsers will also periodically pull out random elements of signed tree heads that other browsers have seen, just randomly pull them out of the pool. And there'll be multiple of these, collect these pools run by different people so that if one of them's cheating, um, that will be proof against that. And then um, the browser will, for, for whatever, just any random signed tree heads that it pulls out of the pool, it will uh, ask the log server to produce the log consistency proof for that pair of signed tree heads. And you know, if nobody's cheating, these signed, it should always be easy for the log server to produce, you know, any uh, consistency proof that's demanded of it. But if it's forked somebody, suppose that the log server has forked somebody and given them a signed tree head that's really describes a totally different log or, or even a log that differs in one element from um, the logs that everybody else is seeing, eventually that browser will contribute that, that signed tree head to the pool the gossip pool, then eventually somebody else um, will pull that signed tree head out of the pool and ask for a proof for, you know, some other signed tree head that presumably is on a different fork. And then the log server will not be able to produce the proof. And um, since they're signed, since the signed tree heads are signed by the log server, um, that's just absolute proof that uh, the log server has forked um, two of its clients, presumably with intent to reveal a bogus certificate to one of them and hide it from the other. Okay, but there's actually another place where it turns out you need the um, uh, these consistency proofs, not just uh, during gossip, but actually also during the ordinary operation of the browsers. Um, so, um, the, uh, the difficulty is that suppose, um, you know, suppose a browser is, is kind of seeing a, a consistent version of the log, it's the same as everybody else, um, but then a uh, log server wants to trick it into using this bogus um, uh, certificate. So the um, log server sends it um, a signed tree, you know, it makes a signed tree that's different from everybody else that refers to a, you know, malicious log that contains this bad certificate, but for everybody else, since it doesn't want other people to notice, certainly doesn't want, you know, the monitors to notice, you know, cooks up this other log that um, is what everybody else is seeing. All right, so now the, um, you know, the browser checks and sees, you know, asks for inclusion proof, and the inclusion, the log server will be able to produce the inclusion proof because this signed tree head that the browser has really does refer to this bad log. So the browser will go ahead and use this bogus certificate and maybe get tricked and give away the user's password to you know, who knows what. Um, but um, depending on the details of how the browsers work, we're at risk of the next time the browser, which you know, doesn't realize anything's gone wrong, talks to the log server, the log server might then say, oh, you know, there's a new log with a bunch of new stuff on it. And here is the signed tree head of the current log. Why don't you um, switch, why don't you use that as your signed tree head? And so now, um, if that were allowed to happen, then the browsers now have completely lost the evidence that anything went wrong because now the browser is using the same trees as everybody else. You know, it's going to contribute this signed tree head to the gossip pool. It's all going to look good. And um, we had this sort of brief evil tree that was evil log that was revealed, evil log fork. But um, if the browser is willing to accept a new signed tree head, then huh, we can basically have the browser forget about it. So um, we want, what we want is this, uh, we, what we want is for if a browser, if the log service um, shows a particular log to the browser that the browser, that it can't trick the browser into switching away from that log. That is that um, we wanna be able to enforce that the browser sees only strict extensions to the log that it's seen already and doesn't simply get switched to a log that is not compatible with the log the browser's seen before. And so the property that we're looking for is actually called fork consistency. 
Um, and what that name refers to is that if the browser has been forked onto a different fork from other people, then um, it must stay on that fork and it, uh, it should never be able to switch um, to the main fork. And the reason for that is we want to preserve, we need to preserve this bad sign tree head and its successors um, so that when the browser participates in the gossip protocol, um, it's, it's contributing um, sign tree heads that nobody else has and that cannot be proved to be compatible using the log consistency proof. Okay, so how do we achieve for consistency? Well, um, it's actually easy with the tools we have now. Every time the log server tells a browser, oh, here's a new sign tree head for a longer log, the browser will require the, uh, will not accept the new sign tree head um, until the log server has, pr has produced a log consistency proof that the new sign tree head um, describes a uh, suffix of the old sign tree head. That is that the log of the old sign tree has a prefix of the log of the new sign tree head. And of course, if a log server is, has forked the browser and is keeping the browser on that same fork, well, it can produce the proofs. But of course, you know, it's digging its grave even deeper because um, it's producing more and more sign tree heads for a f uh, which will eventually be caught by the gossip protocol. Whereas if the um, log server tries to cause the browser to switch um, to a sign tree head that describes the same log everybody else has been seeing, um, the browser will demand a consistency proof and the uh, log server will not be able to produce it because indeed uh, the log described by the first sign tree head is not a prefix of the log um, described by the second sign tree head. Okay. Um, Okay, so the system, these, these uh, log consistency proofs provide for consistency and for consistency plus gossiping and the, um, requiring this uh, log consistency proofs for the sign tree heads found by gossiping. Um, the two of them together uh, make it likely that all the participants are seeing the same log and that if they're not seeing the same log, they'll be able to detect that fact by the failure um, of a log consistency proof. Any questions? Okay, so that, um, how many log servers are there? That is a great question. So um, I described the system as if there was just one log server. It turns out in the real system, there's lots of log servers, at least dozens. So this is a deployed system which you can poke around in um, that is actually used by Chrome and I think Safari. Um, there are um, at least dozens of these log servers and when certificate and certificate authorities are actually required by Chrome to submit all their certificates uh, to, the, um, to the log servers, to, to multiple log servers. Um, the different log servers don't actually keep identical logs. Um, the convention is that a certificate authority will submit a new certificate to say, you know, a couple, maybe five different log servers. Um, and actually in the certificate information that a website tells your browser, it includes the identities of the um, log servers, of the certificate transparency log servers that have the certificate in their logs. So your browser knows which log servers to talk to. Um, and the reason why there's more than one of them is of course some of them may go bad. Some of them may turn out to be malicious or go out of business or who knows what. Um, and in that case, you still wanna have a couple more uh, to fall back on. Um, they don't have to be identical because they don't. Um, as long as the certificate is in w at least one log that's you know, as far as anybody knows is trustworthy, that's sufficient because um, you know, it, it, the, the issue here is not really necessarily the, the fact that the log had the certificate in it, because that's not proof that the certificate is good. All we're looking for is log servers that aren't forking the, um, the monitors and browsers that use them. Um, so it's enough for a certificate to be in even a single um, log server that's not forking people because then the monitors are guaranteed to see it because the monitors check all 
um, the log servers. So if a bogus certificate shows up, even, even a single log server, the monitors will eventually notice um, because all the monitors look at all the um, log servers that the browsers are willing to accept. All right, another question. Um, what prevents a log server from going down and issuing bogus certificates uh, before they get caught? You know, nothing actually. Um, if you're willing to, it, it, that's definitely a defect in the system that at least for a while, um, you can, a uh, malicious log server can trick browsers into accepting bogus certificates. So if you have a certificate authority that's, that's become malicious and is issuing bogus certificates, they look correct, but they're bogus, um, and a log server, um, then that, that's willing to serve these, that's willing to put these certificates in the log, and of course they all are, then at least for a while, browsers will be willing to use them. The thing is though, that the, uh, you know, they will be caught. And th this is, this system is, its intent is to improve the situation. Right? In the pre-certificate transparency system, if somebody was issuing bogus certificates and browsers were being tricked into using them, you might never find out ever. In the certificate transparency world, you may not find out right away. And so some, some people may use them, um, but then relatively quickly, you know, a few days or something, the monitors will start to notice that the, there's bad certificates in the logs and somebody will go and track it down and figure out who is malicious or who is making mistakes. Um, yeah, so I guess a certificate, uh, certificate transparency law could refuse to talk to the monitors. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I think ultimately the, the if, um, you know, we're now treading into a kind of non-technical region, um, you know, what to do if there's evidence that something's gone wrong. This is actually quite hard because uh, much of the time if something seems to go wrong, even bogus certificates often, um, often the reason is just somebody made a mistake. It was a legitimate mistake. You know, somebody blew it and it's not evidence of malice. It's just that somebody made a mistake. Um, so I think what would happen if a monitor was misbehaving in almost any way, like not answering requests. If it was doing co consistently, people will notice and um, either ask them to shape up or take them out of the list of, or stop using them and have the browser vendors would take that log server out of the list of acceptable log servers after a while. But yeah, there's like a gray area of, of bad behavior that's not bad enough to, to warrant being taken out of the acceptable list. I think if a log server has been found to fork, the question is what if a log server has been found to fork, what happens then? Um, I think I, I think what would happen is the people who are run, you know, the people, who, the browser vendors um, would talk to the log server and ask them, the people running the log server and ask them what happened. Um, and if they came up with a convincing explanation that they had made a mistake, um, you know, which maybe they could, maybe, I don't know, they, their machine crashes, it loses part of their log, they restart, you know, starting from a prefix of the log and start growing a different log. Um, if it seems like a mistake, honest mistake, then, um, well, it was a mistake. Um, but if, it, if the log server operators can't provide a convincing explanation of what happened, then I think the browser vendors would just delete them from the list of acceptable um, log servers. Um, okay, but these are, um, you know, uh, these are uh, sort of problems with the system because you can, you know, the, the definitions of like who owns a name or what acceptable behavior, you know, whether it's okay for your server to be down or not. These are very hard to pin down uh, properties. You know, I, I think the, the, the system's not foolproof. Um, you could definitely get away with bad behavior, at least for a while. Um, but the hope is that there's strong enough auditing here that if uh, some certificate authority or log server was persistently badly behaved, um, that people would notice, the monitors would notice, they may not do anything for a while, but eventually they would um, decide that, you know, you're either too much of a pain or too malicious to be part of the system. Um, and delete you from the browser lists. Of course, this put the browser vendors in a position of quite strong power. So 
Um, while the system is in general pretty decentralized, you know, there can be lots of certificate authorities and lots of um, certificate transparency log servers. There's only a handful of browser vendors and they're because they maintain the lists of acceptable certificate authorities and uh, log servers, they do have a lot of power. And you know, it's the way it is, unfortunately. Um, okay, so things to take away from um, uh, certificate transparency design. So one thing is the key property it has, super important, is just that everyone sees the same log um, even if some of the parties are malicious. Either everyone sees the same log or they can accumulate evidence from failed proofs uh, that something's funny is going on. And because both browsers who are using the certificates and the owners of the DS, DNS names who are running monitors um, see the same log because of these proofs, um, the monitors can detect problems and therefore the browsers, even though the browsers can't actually detect bogus certificates, they can at least be confident that there, if there's bogus certificates out there that monitors will detect them um, and possibly put them on revocation lists. Actually, that's something I didn't mention. If, if there's evidence, if a monitor spots what must be a bogus certificate, like MIT sees somebody they don't know about, um, being issued a certificate for MIT.edu. It turns out there's a pre-existing revocation service that you can put bad certificates on um, that the browsers check. So if a monitor sees a bogus certificate, it can actually be effectively disabled by putting it on the, in the revocation, certificate revocation system. That's not part of certificate transparency. It's been around for a long time. Okay, um, so the key property is everyone sees the same log of certificates. Um, another thing to take away from this is that if you can't figure out a way to prevent bad behavior, um, maybe you can build something at least uh, usable that relies on auditing instead of preventing. That is, can detect bad things after the fact. Um, that might be good enough. That's often much easier than preventing the bad things. Um, some technical ideas are here in this, in this work. One is this idea of equivocation that um, a big danger is the possibility that um, um, a malicious server will sort of provide split views, one view to one set of uh, people, another view to another set of people. It's usually called a fork or equivocation. It's an important kind of attack. Another property, this fork consistency property, it turns out it's often valuable to, when you're worried about forks, to build a system that forces um, the malicious server, once it has forked somebody, to keep them on that fork so it can't erase evidence. Um, by erasing a fork. Um, the final technical trick um, is the notion of gossiping in order to, to detect fork. It's, it's actually, gen if the participants don't communicate with each other, um, it's actually typically not possible to notice that there has been a fork. So if you want to detect forks, there has to be one way or another, some kind of gossip, some kind of um, communication between the parties so that they can compare notes and detect forks. Um, and, We'll see most of these things again uh, next week when we look at Bitcoin. And that's all I had to say.